Hello and welcome to Insight of Thalmology. This is Dr. Amrit welcoming you to another important lecture in glaucoma. Today we are studying the primary congenital glaucoma. The primary congenital glaucoma, as the name suggests, it's a primary condition that means it is a problem in the trabecular meshwork and the anterior chamber angle and there is no other ocular or systemic developmental anomalies. So this is very important. It is called primary because there is no ocular or systemic developmental anomalies. Only the, de the developmental anomaly is present within the trabecular meshwork and the anterior chamber angle. It is congenital because it is seen in kids and it can present at birth and leads to glaucoma. Therefore, it is primary congenital glaucoma. So it is a genetically determined abnormality in the trabecular meshwork or in the anterior chamber angle which will lead to increased intraocular pressure without other ocular or systemic developmental anomalies. Now there are so many names of the primary congenital glaucoma. It was called the trabeculodysgenesis which means that there is dysgenesis that is maldevelopment of the trabecular meshwork or it is also referred to as the goniodysgenesis Gonio means the angle, so dysgenesis is the maldevelopment and it is also called the primary infantile glaucoma. Now, however, the term which is now very commonly used and also adapted by the international classification system for childhood glaucoma is the primary congenital glaucoma. Now, the International Classification System for Childhood Glaucoma, it actually tells you the definition of the childhood glaucomas. Now, when we talk about the glaucomas in adult, it is very important that the optic nerve gets involved in adults and there is a, a corresponding visual field defect also present and then the adult is said to have glaucoma. However, in childhood glaucomas, the proper or exact definition is irreversible or reversible damage to the whole eye. So you will see changes in the entire eyeball in childhood glaucomas and that is the definition which is adapted by the international classification system. So the primary congenital glaucoma is the most common type of uh, primary childhood glaucomas and important thing is that it is a primary condition that means there is no other systemic or ocular abnormality associated which is causing the glaucoma in these cases. So the primary congenital glaucoma usually affects both the eyes in most of the cases. So it's a bilateral disease. It is autosomal recessive and therefore the consanguinity actually increases the risk in, uh, of a child uh, developing the congenital glaucoma. Now there are five genes which are uh, five gene loci which are actually identified with the occurrence of primary congenital glaucoma and these are the GLC3A, 3B, 3C, 3D and 3E and the most common gene which is uh, associated is the CYP1B1 gene which is associated with the cytochrome P451B1. So remember this gene, this gene is very important and the gene is actually associated with a lot of metabolic activities and migration of the neural crest cells which occurs during the development of the trabecular meshwork and the angle. So how does uh, this primary congenital glaucoma develop? So let us talk about the pathophysiology. So basically because of those genetic defects in the CYP1B1 gene, so we are having the problems in development of the cornea and the trabecular meshwork and that is called the corneotrabecular dysgenesis. Because of the corneotrabecular dysgenesis, now we have an abnormal trabecular meshwork. Because of the abnormal trabecular meshwork, as we know that the trabecular meshwork is basically associated with the filtration of the aqueous so whenever the trabecular meshwork is not adequate there will not be good amount of filtration of the aqueous humor in the eye and because of that inadequate filtration of the aqueous humor we will have increased pressure in the eyeball now what happens in a child is that the child has very stretchable eyeballs okay kids have very stretchable eyeballs so what happens is that because of that more stretchability of the eye which is seen in kids compared to adults the eye is going to enlarge in response to the pressure rise in the eyeball now because of that pressure rise the eyeball will enlarge and even the cornea will get enlarged. Moreover, one more specific feature which is seen in uh, children and is that they will develop corneal edema quite early. Okay. 
So histopathologically, what is seen uh, in these kids is that the trabecular pillars are really thick compared to the normal individual. They are thick because of the deposition of abnormal collagen within them. So clinically, evidence has also uh, shown that uh, these trabecular pillars, not just are they too thick, but also there's a lot of traction on them. So what happens is traction is nothing but abnormal pull which is occurring on these trabecular pillars right so what happens is because of the traction because of the pull if they were supposed to be like this because of the pull they are arranged in such a manner that they there is actually compaction and decrease within the space uh, decrease of the spaces which are present within the trabecular meshwork okay so because of the traction there is compaction of the trabecular spaces and because of that compaction and narrow spaces the aqueous outflow will be impaired okay so first thing is trabecular pillars are thick because of abnormal collagen deposition and there is traction on the pillars in these cases and because of which there is impairment of the aqueous outflow and one more thing which is seen is high ciliary muscle insertion so i will tell you what is meant by the high ciliary muscle insertion so the most common hypothesis which is accepted for the development of the primary congenital glaucoma is the Anderson's hypothesis. Now according to Anderson, he said that during the third trimester what happens is the ciliary body which is inserted anteriorly uh, during the childbirth, okay, uh, not, no, sorry, during the development of the embryo, the ciliary body and the peripheral iris are actually located quite anteriorly. But when the child reaches the third trimester, the third trimester of the pregnancy, okay, that means during the seventh month, eighth month and the ninth month of pregnancy, what happens is that the ciliary body and the peripheral iris will now be pushed posteriorly and they will now be attached at their normal position. That means they are clearing off from the cornea and the sclera. So Anderson proposed that because of the excessive and the premature accumulation of collagenous beams. So I told you that the trabecular beams are quite thick in these kids and because of the excessive collagenous deposition in these trabecular beams, what will happen now is that uh, for some reason, this posterior sliding of the ciliary body and the peripheral iris will be inhibited. Now, as they do not slide posteriorly, what will happen now, they will be inserted quite anteriorly. So, there will be anterior insertion of the iris root and the ciliary muscle. Now, since they are inserted anteriorly, it means that, that they are inserted quite anterior to the scleral spur and they are also inserted near the trabecular meshwork, obstructing the normal flow of the aqueous through the trabecular meshwork and sometimes they might even compress the slim canal. So because of that, so this is what I meant by the high ciliary muscle insertion or the anterior ciliary muscle insertion seen in this uh, primary congenital glaucoma. Coming to the presentation of the primary congenital glaucoma. Now there are various variants uh, by which they can present. So one is the newborn onset. Newborn onset means that the primary congenital glaucoma will present or is present in about uh, right at birth or one month of age. Infantile onset means from one year of age to two years, so one to 24 months, okay? Then the late onset or late recognized is usually after two years of age. And the fourth category is spontaneously arrested cases in which the IOP becomes normal and they will be actually hard stride. That's, that all, that's all you're going to see on the clinical uh, examination of such patients. So as you can see that the term infantile glaucoma does not suit all these presentation because the child can actually present as a newborn onset, as an infantile onset or late onset also or spontaneously arrested cases. Therefore, the term primary congenital glaucoma is more suitable rather than the infantile uh, glaucoma. In these, uh, the newborn onset is the most uh, dangerous and is associated with the most poor prognosis. Now, what are the symptoms with which the child will present to you with the primary congenital glaucoma? Now, most of these symptoms are because of the raised IOP and that raised IOP will then lead to corneal edema. The occurrence of corneal edema in a child with primary congenital glaucoma occurs quite early compared to the adults because the cornea in kids is not so well equipped by uh, in getting rid of the excess fluid that gets deposited in the cornea because of the raised IOP. So the symptoms that we basically see are discomfort with light which is called photophobia, 
then the child will also have a contraction of the orbicularis or the spasm of the orbicularis which is called blepharospasm and then there also be excessive tearing which is called epiphora now these three things are they form the classic triad of glaucoma seen in kids okay of childhood glaucoma so these are photophobia blepharospasm and tearing so this is very important apart from that the other symptoms or complaints which the parents might come to you can be the cloudy corneas and corneal scarring and other thing is large eyes now i already told you why they come with large eyes because in in small kids or in newborns the eyeball is quite stretchable so as the pressure or within the eyeball increases the eye also enlarges in size and that is the reason why the uh, the parents sometimes might come to you complaining that their child have abnormally large eyes and definitely there will be corneal edema because of which the clarity and the transparency of the cornea will be lost and we will have cloudy corneas and scarring of the cornea coming to the clinical signs that we see in primary congenital glaucoma the clinical signs can be large eyes which is also called the buphthalmos this is uh, happening again because of the excessive stretchability of the ocular tissue seen in kids along with that even the cornea will get enlarged which is called the megalocornea or large cornea now because of that excessive stretching sometimes the desmet membrane which is an inner layer of the cornea will develop a break within it and this break is used usually oblique in orientation or horizontal in orientation so you are going to see the stroma and then on the either side of the stroma you are going to see this desmet tears okay uh, bordering that stromal area and such striae are called the harp striae so if you want to remember uh, the orientation you can remember it from the first letter of the harp striae that is h and h here represents the horizontal striations apart from that you can have corneal edema development corneal scarring development and because of the excessive uh, eyeball size you can have progressive myopia and astigmatism which is very common in these kids and because of the uncorrected refractive errors and sometimes because of the excessive corneal edema sensory deprivation they can also develop amblyopia So now let us answer some of the why questions. Why do you see corneal edema in these patients? So what is the link between IOP and corneal edema? In these patients, whenever the IOP rises beyond thirty to forty mm of mercury, the endothelial cells will not be able to function properly, and they cannot pump the excess fluid out from the cornea. Along with that, there will be excessive stretching, which we know is occurring in these kids, because of which we will have stri formation, half stri. Once a tear develops in the desmet membrane the aqueous which is present in the aqueous humor can also seep into the cornea leading to corneal edema so as you can see here we can see this uh, lines oblique line going on horizontally like this this line is these two lines actually represents a tear in the desmet membrane and in between you have the stroma and this is your harps stri Now the second question is why do you see corneal enlargement now uh, to answer that at birth the diameter of cornea is about 9.5 to 10.5 mm and then it increases to 10 to 11.5 mm by the age of 1 Now, if you see any diameter of the cornea which is greater than 12 mm before 1 year of age, okay, or before child's first birthday, or if there's any asymmetry between two eyes, or if the diameter of the cornea is greater than 13 mm of uh, 13 mm at any age, then definitely you have to suspect glaucoma in such children. And the reason for corneal enlargement is again corneal stretching. The stretching can also occur in the other tissues of the ocular uh, of the eye. And uh, what happens is that the cornea stops enlarging at the age of three years. So this is very important. That after three years, even if the pressure rises, the cornea will not enlarge further. However, the sclera continues to stretch up to a age of ten years, and therefore the uh, the eyeball enlargement or the buphthalmus will continue to happen.
The other uh, re, uh, sign which you see is optic nerve cupping which is also occurring in these kids because of the stretching mechanism. Now as we know the cornea stretches, the sclera sketches and as the sclera is stretching there will be posterior bowing of the lamina cribrosa and as the posterior bowing of the lamina cribrosa happens the optic canal also stretches because of which you will feel as if the neuroretinal rim has decreased thickness and it will look as if there is optic nerve cupping. However, when the IOP is normalized, there can be a reversal of the cupping. So, this is a very important feature of primary congenital glaucoma that there is reversal of cupping. However, whenever there is a, in advanced glaucomas, whenever there is a retinal nerve fiber layer damage, okay, then the cupping will more uh, likely be permanent. In older children, those with advanced glaucomas, cupping actually is occurring because of the new retinal rim tissue along with the stretchability. So, and so these cases will not show any reversal of cupping. The first picture you can see there's corneal edema and in second picture you can see here the cupping which is in primary congenital glaucoma. Coming to the diagnosis and what all investigations you do in such children who come with primary congenital glaucoma. The first uh, measurement that we take is IOP and IOP in kids is done uh, with Perkins or McKay mark tonometer. In older children, we can use the Goldman's tonometer as well. Then corneal diameter should be measured. You can use the graticule function on the slit lamp. Anterior chamber depth, gonioscopy has to be done along with axial length measurement and direct or indirect ophthalmoscopy to, to have a look at the optic nerve cupping. Cycloplegic refraction must be done to rule out myopia and astigmatism. Coming to some findings on gonioscopy in infantile glaucoma or primary congenital glaucoma. The gonioscopy that you do has to be done under sedation or general anesthesia. And as I told you in my course on gonioscopy, you have to do direct gonioscopy using the Kepi's or Hoskin, Barkin or Swan Jacobs lens. Now, however, the gonioscopy in infants is somewhat difficult. And the reason is that number one, that there will be marked corneal edema which makes it very difficult for us to visualize the angle structure. Number two, there is not proper demarcation of the angle structure because of which you will have an amorphous appearance of the angle. And third is identification of the posterior trabecular meshwork is also difficult because kids or infants they do not have much pigmentation. And what are the angle characteristics that you see in the congenital glaucoma? Sorry, I've written infantile. Infantile and congenital both can be used uh, for the same disease. So the angles characteristics that you see, the angles will be immature. There will be flatter iris configuration. The periphery of the iris will be thinner because of the maldevelopment of the iris as well. There will be higher irregular insertion of the iris as I already explained to you and sometimes there will be a generalized sheen in the trabecular meshwork because of the thickened trabecular beams. So that's all for today. Thank you and have a nice day.